we need to make sure that the financial data gets presented to, to all the key leaders who need it, staff also, right? A lot of program people will tell you they're not numbers people and have had a terrible relationship with numbers, but we need them to be engaged with their budgets. We need them to be able to make good strategic financial decisions and engaged in those conversations. And so it's things like doing a financial dashboard with a lot of graphics. A good graphic in 30 seconds can spark the organization to have really important critical conversations that they need to have around money and around their fiscal solvency. And it can make all the difference in um, being able to have in the right kind of engagement that you need with your program staff, with your board leaders. Hey friends, welcome back. We are still talking about several nonprofit strategies around grant writing and ways that we can support our grant writing process. One of those is to make sure you watch my TEDx talk, The Real ROI of Grant Writing. You can find that on YouTube or at TeresaHuff.com slash TEDx22. Make sure you check that out and share it with your board, your volunteers, your team. Let's spread the word and let's help each other build a more effective nonprofit process and build the systems behind powering our grant writing efforts so that we can be more effective and sustainable long term. And that is one reason I invited today's guest on the show. I'm talking with my friend Sean Hale. He was on the Nonprofit Mythbusters Roundtable a few weeks ago. You may remember that. If you were not able to attend, you can find that on the website or on your podcast player if you prefer audio. And it's also on my YouTube channel, Grant Writing Simplified. By the way, did you know I have a YouTube channel? Grant Writing Simplified. <laughs> that was kind of an accident, thanks to my podcast editor. And so here we are, and you can watch it whichever way you prefer. Anyway, back to Sean. Another topic that I have been wanting to talk about on the show and invite a guest is nonprofit accounting and systems in HR. However, now before I lose you here, <laughs> I didn't want it to be super dry and just, you know, spouting off numbers and spreadsheets and talk of revenue and balance sheets, none of that kind of stuff. I wanted this to be really practical and digging into how does this apply to nonprofits? How can we track our books better? And how can we have good systems to better support our work? So when I met Sean, I knew he would be a great guest because he's very thorough and detailed, and he also has some really great experience and stories about some nonprofits that he's worked with. So he's a wealth of information, and I think you'll get a lot of really good input and ideas, hopefully, from this episode. He has worked in nonprofits for over 20 years, and he really loves helping nonprofits get their administrative side of things running smoothly so the organization can shine and really focus in on their work that they do best. So he takes care of a lot of those systems and bookkeeping and sometimes the more complex types of tasks, and then that frees the nonprofit up to really dig into their work. Over his career, he has accomplished a lot of improvements that sometimes have reduced waste, generated new revenue, boosted morale and productivity, grew financial transparency, and minimized risk. And he's also helped boards and management navigate complex situations and really strives to leave an organization stronger and ready for growth. He now leads his own agency of nonprofit accounting and finance professionals. He is also the co-founder of Philanthroforce, which he will tell us more about in the episode, but a very cool platform for finding and sharing opportunities for work and support in the nonprofit realm. So I encourage you to check that out and enjoy this episode with Sean Hale. John, welcome. It's great to have you and to talk with you again. Before we dig in, tell us a random fact about yourself. Oh, just one random fact. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to try and squeeze in three. I, I play guitar. I love board games. I also love studying languages. I speak Spanish fluently. And that's in fact what we speak here at home with the kids. Oh, fun. Okay. Yeah. I learned Spanish in high school, but that's been a minute since I had that. So yeah. 
That's one of those skills that for me, it's come in really handy at the most random times. Uh huh. It, it can definitely, um, yeah, come in at unexpected times and, you know, you, you totally expect it like when you're on holiday in Mexico or, or Costa Rica, totally expect it. But, you know, a growing number of people who live in America have Spanish as a first language and may not have strong English skills. Um, and we especially find that here in Texas where I'm based. And so um, it's it feels good to me, certainly, to be able to switch into that. Um, and also there are just all the benefits that we're discovering about uh, raising children bilingually. And we've certainly seen that with our kids, that things like math are a breeze to our kids. And a lot of the literature says that there's a correlation there. If, if kids are raised bilingually or multilingually, then you can expect things like math to come easily because they're using their brains and they're wiring their brains in just different ways from people who only grow up with one language. Mm, very cool. Yeah, I've heard that with kids, especially in that window. There's a certain age range that like they just absorb the language like a sponge and it's so natural. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, very cool. So tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to get into nonprofit work specifically. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I grew up in Idaho and I remember we were driving around southeast Idaho. I was probably about 10 years old and we were driving around the the desert to, I don't know where exactly my parents needed to go, but we need to go somewhere. And uh, I was looking out the window and just thinking about the good fortune that I've had in my life, um, more so than, than most people in the world, right? Uh, there are people that then and today are living in war zones, people who are living on a dollar a day, children who are dying of starvation. So I was very well aware of that at that age. And I, I realized then, and I still believe that everybody deserves an opportunity to get a good education, to live without hunger, to live without constant danger, and to really make the most of themselves, whatever that means for each person. And so I decided that I wanted to do what I could to so that more people could have the kinds of opportunities that I've had. I just see that as a, as a human right. And those of us who, who have been born with more privilege, we ought to lend a hand. Or certainly I wanted to lend a hand to help people who were born with more challenges than I was born with. So it essentially so, became a type of calling that you were just drawn to and compelled to serve in that way. Yeah, yeah. And so in uh, 1999, I got my first nonprofit job and it was a small development organization doing work in El Salvador. And uh, it was just the founder and me for many years. Um, I got to wear all the hats. That's one of the good things of working in a startup nonprofit. You get to see, all right, right, where do I, what do I enjoy? Where do I add value? What might not be fun for me? Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that I learned, and it really surprised me, um, I learned that I'm really good at building the infrastructure for organizational success. And I had no idea growing up that that would be something that I could do or take joy in. But um, to give you an example, the year before I started at that job in 1998, Hurricane Mitch hit El, uh, Central America. And the founder, because he was just on his own then, was able to raise about $200,000. Three years later, um, in 2001, and I'd been there about six months on a, a full-time full basis at that point, and we had two massive earthquakes hit, and we were able to raise a million dollars. And it's, wow. not, it's not because I'm a master fundraiser. I'm not. I, I did not wear a whole lot of the fundraising hat. It, instead, it was we had the infrastructure in place to respond to the opportunities that occurred, opportunities to get the support and relief to the folks in El Salvador. And so that's the kind of difference that a having a strong back office in place can make. Mm -hmm. You know, I love you point that out because I work with nonprofits to back up and build their grant strategy first before they just start going after grants. Because even if they're awarded a grant, if they're a mess in their operations and their programs and people, you've seen it, I can tell by your expression, it, it'll be a mess and the grant will be all over the place. They won't know how to implement. They won't have the capacity. So it's key. It's critical to back up and make sure that infrastructure is solid operations are smooth and you can refine as you grow, but you've got to have that foundation to start with. You got to have a strong foundation. It is so much harder to build it after you've gotten the grant or you've had the massive influx of money. Um, and 
Yeah, and if you screw up that first grant, well, the grantor is probably not going to be likely to renew with you, right? And so you also yeah. burn your credibility. So you're actually worse off than you were before you got the grant if you do not have right. a strong foundation under you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I did uh, that job uh, supporting uh, rural folks in Central America for nine years. And then after that, I got to work for a church. I got to work for a development organization doing good work in Kenya. And then I got to spend four years as the chief financial and operations officer at the our local Central Texas capacity building organization. And that was a great experience. But I wanted to do more work that would help small and mid-sized nonprofits really move the needle with their back offices. And so I went out on my own in, three years ago now, January 2020. And um, since then, my practice, it's been... I. I my hypothesis was that there's a need and that's not being filled. And I've gotten a lot of confirmation because now we are a team of nine people on three continents. And it's just been wonderful to get to work with so many great organizations and also to, to get to connect so many of my colleagues to opportunities to help nonprofits that are really meaningful to them and that were in roles where they can be really helpful to those nonprofits, whether it's um, you know, like sometimes it's doing some complicated Excel work. Sometimes it's providing strategic financial advice and all the other things under the sun. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, just a real pleasure for me to, to get to work with a team of great people. And on the other hand, match them up with these really cool nonprofits. That's awesome. And it's really cool that you can be that connector, sort of that hub for connecting the dots between what they need and the services they can provide. I'm curious, yeah. in these different roles and nonprofits that you've mentioned, were you completely remote or did you work on site with these organizations? Um, back when I was an employee. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, you know, the international ones. I spent most of the time in the U.S. because we needed to have infrastructure and things here. But um, with both those organizations, I, I did get to do site visits which certainly was uh, transformative to me to really understand in depth um, the life experience of the people that we were serving and that, you know, that I had uh, to a certain degree an academic understanding of, but it's very different to get to meet and uh, break bread with and uh, spend time with the folks that you're serving and really listen to them, listen to their stories, interact um and uh yeah i you know you you and i like to uh bust myths and certainly like i had certainly some myths and misconceptions busted through my interactions with the good folks that we got to serve and it really helped enrich me as a person enriched me enriched my understanding of what uh so many other people live with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis Mm -hmm. I've always felt like with grant writing and working with clients, nothing replaces an actual site visit. If at all possible, I highly recommend trying to visit the location at least once. Even if you're a remote grant writer, there's nothing like being there in person, seeing the people walking through, hearing their passion come through, seeing the operations firsthand, just the practicality. And sometimes you'll spot things they didn't think to mention. Like, wait, you don't even have a printer here. You have to go next door to the coffee copy shop or like different things that they don't even think to mention because they're so used to it. But immediately you can spot it and be like, that's got to be part of my grant writing story. And I'm sure for you, it's the same way. It becomes a part of the work you do. And like, oh, this piece is missing in their back office. We really need to plug that in. That That's so true. We, we until we've had those experiences, it's hard to really understand the what they just take for, for granted on stuff. And one thing that blew my mind uh, working in Central America is when I discovered that a lot of these organizations, humidity and dust are a uh, are real problem in a way that we just mm -hmm. don't even think about here in the states and so like if you want your paper to not jam in your printer or your copier you need to store your your copy paper in a box and put a light bulb in there and leave that light bulb on 24 7 and close the box up just so it'll stay dry because wow. if the community gets up then it's going to be jamming up your equipment and and there are a thousand individual details like that that you know you add them up and okay this is this is really different. Um, after the 
after the um, earthquakes in El Salvador, we had this very generous donor step forward with uh, housing. And we thought, wow, this is great. And they raised tons of money to um, for this new technology. Um, and really clever technology, basically using, uh, they figured out how to bend oriented strand board, which is kind of a form of plywood and turn it into these uh, homes really quickly, inexpensively. Um, that was all really cool um, until we figured out that it was also delicious for these special Central American termites called comejenes. And um, they, those ones, apparently, they're, they really just don't see like cement as a barrier and they'll just, they'll find their way to anything that's wooden. And so you build a house out of wood and just like, they're, it's not going to last very long. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a critical piece to know as you're building things like that. We would not even think of, like you said. So that's the kind of thing also, they probably wouldn't have thought to tell you either because it's so normal to them. Like some of the things we do or deal with or like you know we try not to have spiders in our house here and so we do certain things but we wouldn't think to tell somebody from another country if they said so what's your house like we wouldn't think to describe yeah we spray or have spider traps to make sure we don't get like that's just not a thing but if they came here they might be like what's that you know why do you have that little piece of cardboard in the corner mm -hmm. we don't want spiders in our basement so it's just little <laughs> things we don't even think about, but you need to be on site to understand what they do and how they have to prevent paper from jamming all the time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What do you think has been the most unique or maybe inspiring situation you have worked with? Oh, well, uh, if it's all right, I'll share a story about there's a, there was a big kind of light bulb going off moment for me when I was doing the the work in El Salvador, and you know you can you can even make many visits down there and still you know not understand all of it. And so one thing that I'd been asking the local staff about for years was you know help me with some data. I want data to be able to tell the story, right? So I was trying to up our game as an organization, and part of that was Data, cool, data. Um, and we did a number of visits and interviews with uh, beneficiaries of the projects. But the thing that really blew my mind and that I made a priority to communicate Pete, to, to folks here in the US when I got back, it, it was a smidgen of data, but really it was a story in the context around it. Um, one of the projects that we had um, was um, providing a, uh, I think, I think we might have been doing it on credit. Anyway, you know, like a couple hundred dollars for a dozen chickens and the basic um, infrastructure to be able to raise chickens because this is a project that um, women, even if they're stuck at home and can't go out and work, this is a way for them to provide nutrition for their families and for them to also potentially have a little bit of uh, money coming in the door that is the woman's money rather than being dependent on her husband or other people. And so really cool project on paper. Um, but one thing that I was having a really difficult time understanding was really painting the picture on the financial impact for folks up in the US. And I want to be able to tell the story like, yeah, you know, these women go from, you know, you know, having zero income to, you know, selling two dozen eggs a week and, you know, having statistics and that represents $2,000 a year, blah, 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 return on your investment, right? So you're kind of standard um business orientation um and this this woman you know when i started asking these questions she told a story and uh started telling a story and she actually ended up um breaking down crying a couple of times during the story which was totally unexpected for me like i'm just i'm just asking you know how many eggs and how much do you sell them for where's this coming from um and it turns out that yeah with the little egg business we had that that, that you know the family would eat a few eggs so for protein for the family um, and she would sell a few eggs. And so she'd, you know, save up 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars a week. And um, then, uh, you know, after she'd been with this project for like six months, her um, her father had had gone into some form of assisted living in the big city. And she got a phone call from her sister, Frantic, that um, 
their father had disappeared and nobody knew where he was. The father had uh, some form of dementia. And so she grabbed her savings and her her big savings over all those weeks was maybe like 20 or 30 bucks. She grabbed the savings, got on public transportation, got on another bus, got another bus, got to the big city and helped her sister look for their dad. And they found him. Uh, but, you know, that was a big moment of, of just big impact for them. Certainly it impacted me to get that understanding of how close those families live to the edge and how an amount of money that a lot of us here in the United States, we might, you know, we might not think twice about, you know, $20, you know, that, that might just fall out of our pockets and we wouldn't even notice, or we might use that to get an extra large pizza for the family and, or whatever. And for that, family that meant that just made a massive difference she was able to grab 20 30 bucks go look for dad find him and get him back where he need to be and get him into a safe place because somebody with dementia all by themselves in the big cities yeah mm -hmm. scary mm -hmm. proposition wow just yeah that she could do that and i'm sure that really was part of the emotion for her was that feeling of where is he is he safe are we going to find him and so being able to just grab the funds to go do it, I'm sure was huge for her. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. And so, yeah. So I scrapped my plans to do a hardcore return on investment <laughs> analysis. Mm -hmm. And like, no, this, this story, this, this is really what this program is about and giving the, these, mm -hmm. allowing these families to have a higher level of resilience and to be not so quite on the edge that that's, that's what it's about. ROI can come later, mm -hmm. if at all. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes the ROI is a little harder to quantify in situations like that to really convey the full depth of that impact. It's not necessarily the numbers. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great example. And I'm sure there are so many stories you could share like that. How would you say you are designing your work now in relation to having that impact? What has changed for you with building your team in this way? Well, certainly, you know, it, it's experiences like that that help me provide depth and breadth to what I do and how, and ho hopefully it anyway, it does, and, and, and how I interact with folks and how I set expectations both for the organizations we serve and for the the folks who i get to work with who who deliver the services and one of the key things that um i communicate to everybody and you know this this gets to another myth and so like we everybody should expect financial reports to be accessible to everybody in leadership and and i and i don't mean i can get a copy i mean i should I should be able to make sense of this, even if I'm not a numbers person. And so, and one statistic that um, blew my mind on this, like I, I knew lots of people weren't numbers people, but uh, a few years ago, I got a hold of a, a number that blew my mind. And it is that 93% of American adults have math anxiety, which is 13 out of 14 people. And so if you take your average board meeting, wow. there's like one person in the room who's comfortable <laughs> with the numbers maybe. And, maybe <laughs> and on average and so well okay yeah. now now we understand why people clam up and why their eyes glaze mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. with all you do is you print out a profit and loss statement and you print out a balance sheet and stick it in front of them like of course they're not they don't have anything to say they may be embarrassed they may they're probably disengaged um and we can do better and we need to do better because you need the whole you you presumably the nonprofit has pulled together that board because of their their knowledge and their experience their wisdom and you need them engaging around the financial stuff because that is their their number one duty as a board member right if they can only do one thing let's make sure that our finances are that the organization is fiscally solvent right it's in good financial mm -hmm. shape and so that means that we need to make sure that the financial data it gets presented to to all the key leaders who need it, staff also, right? A lot of program people will tell you they're not numbers people and have had a terrible relationship with numbers, but we need them 
to be engaged with their budgets. We need them to be able to make good strategic financial decisions and engaged in those conversations. And so it's things like doing a financial dashboard with a lot of graphics, right? Graphics, even if you're a numbers person, some good graphics can help tell the story in a way that even for a numbers person could take 10, 15, 20 minutes or longer to come for them to like pull out of the numbers. If, if all you have is raw numbers, a good graphic in 30 seconds can spark the organization to have really important critical conversations that they need to have around money and around their fiscal solvency. And it can make all the difference in um, being able to have in the right kind of engagement that you need with your program staff, with your board leaders, all those folks. Also, um, not not reading the balance sheet, like word for word, penny for penny, which I've seen before. Like, don't go into the board meeting and do that. And instead, you know, if, if you're, uh, whether you're a fractional CFO or your CFO is your full-time job, we need to speak to people in a language that they understand. And that's not going to be CPA speak. We have to put away our CPA vocabulary for that 5, 10, 15 minutes that they let us talk to them. And we need to talk to them. We need to picture somebody in our lives who's not a numbers person, right? And that might be a beloved grandparent or a parent or a friend or a spouse or whatever. But, you know, picture that we need to explain these two, three, four, five critical pieces of information to somebody who has a terrible relationship with numbers. But we need to make that information accessible. And by doing things like that, then all of a sudden they can be involved in the conversation, right? Because we want their wisdom. We want them to be able to speak up about the stuff like, yeah, you know, stop sending us, don't send us a shipping container full of reams of paper because it's all going to go bad, right? We we can only use like maybe two bucks at a time because we're not going to pay for electricity for a lifetime supply to keep a lifetime mm -hmm. supply of paper dry. Right. Yeah, that's just not practical. That's yeah. such a good point. I'm glad you bring that up because, I mean, I even think sometimes maybe a board just defers to the treasurer or to the resident accountant and the totally. rest of them think, okay, that's up to them. That's, they took totally. care of that. I don't need to even understand that, whatever. But totally. I so agree with what you're saying of the whole board needs to understand it. Even if it's they don't have to be experts, but they need to understand the concepts and what's there. And I'm a big fan of using graphics or charts to quickly convey data in grant writing, especially if you have a lot of complex numbers or a whole list of boring stuff that you're trying to convey to a funder of why are all these statistics and numbers in the lunch count important? It's just a whole row of numbers. But when you put it in a graph and you can immediately see, oh, the trend is solidly up or this is definitely going down or whatever it is, that makes all the difference. That clear, quick visual you can see at a glance what's happening here and why is this important? And so with yours, I'm sure you could use a whole variety. Do you have simple tools or ways you recommend of capturing complex information like that into a quick, clear graphic as opposed to having someone have to dig through? Is there a way to automate that to some degree? There are great tools out there for automation. Um, I'm, I'm, my team and I were beginning to, for the full automation, a lot of that, some of that is still more your mid to large sized organizations. Um, but that I suspect within a few years, we're going to see a lot more of that where it, it, it makes sense. And so, but what, what we like, one thing we like to do for, for our clients is, and we have a, a, a basic, a basic starter template for the financial graphic dashboard. Um, and it's a couple of pages, it's eight charts and it's, you know, it's, this isn't a one size fits all thing so much as like, this is going to be good to very good for just about every nonprofit as starter starter date. If you're going from having no graphic representation um, of your financial reports to something, this is quick and easy to just take your data out of QuickBooks or wherever you have it, quickly plug it in, quickly train up the person. You know, if you want us to do it for you, cool, but, you know, we can train your people to maintain this. Um, and then you live and work with that for three, six, nine months and see, okay, you know, is are these are all of these relevant to us? Do we need some additional uh, data to be able to make good decisions? Um, but it's it's a good to just start getting people's expectations and minds wrapped around it. And some of the some of our best thinkers, they will need like multiple 
opportunities to interface with that data and figure out, well, what other questions do I have? And not just the hypothetical questions, but, you know, you're they're sitting there trying to figure out, well, you know, what do we do with this year's gala or whatever, right? Or what we're in a financial pinch and do we just make across the board cuts or are there certain programs that we should be talking about that might um, be providing less, less impact per dollar relative to other activities that we have or what have you. And um, so you find that out over time and you adapt the the dashboard and unless you have, you know, tons of money to throw it in which case, you know, we're happy to, to help you build one with all the bells and whistles and all the possible key performance indicators and all that. But this, this, this we like to start that because most of the folks we work with, they have a, a limited budget. We like to be respectful of that. And so let's, let's get you started on something good. We'll get you started on your, on a, Toyota Camry, and you know, if you eventually need a Mercedes or something like that, cool. We're we're here to help you get into that mm-hmm. that fancier one. But let's let's okay. you know, you haven't had a car before. Let's 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 practice on a, a good dependable vehicle, and we'll take it from mm-hmm. there. Yeah, I love that analogy. And the thing too about that is once you start capturing that snapshot in that dashboard, like you're talking about a template, that gives you data to track over time. It's easy to, at a glance, see, okay, how are we doing compared to five quarters ago? How are we doing each quarter and see our progress? Because then you've got them side by side laid out at a glance. And then you can quickly identify areas of problems, of growth, whatever it is, but that's much easier. You're right. That's critical. Um, if all you get is the balance sheet, that's a snapshot in time of what your what your organization's situation is like. It's a, just a snapshot. And so you can't tell from a balance sheet, are, is our cash reserve growing? Is it shrinking? And, you know, as a board member and for any leader in the organization, they should know the answer to that question. They should know how's our financial uh, resilience changed over the past three, six, 12 months. They should know that at the drop of a hat. They should know things like, um, if there were a big catastrophe, how many days could we operate based on the cash that we have on hand? And that's just, that's another simple metric of financial health. And, you know, some organizations, you know, they might only have a week or two of reserves. That's living pretty close to the edge. And mm-hmm. if you know that you're living close to the edge, then that can also help you make decisions to let's, let's invest in getting some more resilience so that the next time that there is a hiccup here or there, we don't potentially have to close or do massive sudden layoffs or whatever the you know the terrible thing is. If you if you know where where you are, you can get a better sense of yeah, are we making progress towards that goal? Um, a board can set a a goal for their um, their executive director that makes a lot more sense if they have access to good financial data like that. Like yeah, we want to see our reserves grow from three days of reserves to three months of reserves over the next 10 years. And so part of our annual evaluation of you is we want to see something like that reflected in in these reports that we're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And keeping in mind too, that that may affect, like you said, other decisions of, okay, should we invest in this program expansion or do we also need to back up and not grow quite so quickly, but first invest internally in our capacity to make sure we do have that longer sustainability and those reserves on hand before we start pushing for more programs and bigger and another big fundraiser and a lot of expensive equipment. Let's slow it down and look at the bigger picture and make sure we're building that internal capacity. Very true. One other big thing, if you have time to tackle this, is you and I had talked a lot about the 990 previously and how that can be, I guess, misunderstood or not conveyed correctly. So if you have time, I would love to dig into that just a little bit. And then we can do a whole Mythbusters session on on it down the road. Oh, yeah. I got got a page full of myths here for you. Um, Mm. But yeah, I I wonder if I... 990 do you mean maybe audits I yeah you mentioned this conversation yeah we talked about the 990 and how sometimes people are just pulling numbers without understanding what they mean oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah um so yeah there we we as a nonprofit sector we put 
I think inordinate weight on the 990 and on the audit, both of those documents. And we, although it's good data, it's good data to have, um, I, we, we trust and rely on them too much as proxies for other things that they really don't do for us. And so, um, you know, on our, our good frenemy, our, our enemy, the um, overhead myth, for example, like, well, the 990 is a key, provides a key piece of data for that, right? How much is our organization spending on administration and fundraising versus programs? The dirty little secret that most people don't like to talk about is that those numbers can be gamed. And because the 990 is a required filing and because funders want to, they look at many of them, not all of them, but many of them give a lot of weight to those numbers, that incentivizes nonprofits to be flexible in how they fill out the 990 around that and how they allocate staff time. And there's, you know, there's some staff who, yeah, they're like unquestionably 90, 95, 100% on programs, cool, but then you have other staff who are kind of ambiguous. And the inordinate weight that's given to that piece of the 990 incentivizes mm, some nonprofits, perhaps many nonprofits, to stretch the truth and sometimes to break the truth. Because who's in there checking up on that anyway, right? Who, who's double checking on that that particular piece of data? And 990 police. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen them. <laughs> Somebody sitting there with a time, you know, a, a stopwatch, you know, watching the executive director. Okay, they just switched from program work into fundraising work. This e email yeah. was this, and the other. No, like they're they're good faith estimates, and I, I think we want people to give good faith estimates. But when they're going to get dinged for being brutally honest about that, then they're going to be incentivized to, well, you know, maybe I do twenty percent admin, but maybe I only do five percent admin. Yeah, which am I going to put? Which and if and if, it, if it if it's open to any interpretation at all, you know which number the person is going to use. Um, yeah, and what's technically considered admin or not admin? It gets into so much gray. Oh yeah, yeah. If, if you're filling out paperwork, but it's for a program, was that a program or is it administration? Mm -hmm. Right, they're judgment calls. Yeah. Um, and. Similarly, the audit, we we put, I think, inordinate weight on that when more often than not, the audits I've seen, it's um, the auditors taking numbers that are provided by the nonprofit, and they're just restating them in their own format. And they will they will say this, but in auditor speak. And so the audit report will say somewhere on page one or two, it'll say something in very complicated legalese auditor speak that we're just restating these numbers that the nonprofit gave us. And so we really can't tell you the truth of all this, but the even bigger misconception that people have is that the external audit is a good source of fraud prevention. Uh, prevention. And it is in fact a pretty lousy way to go. It's pretty lousy defenses against fraud um, because that's not what the auditors are typically there to do. They, if they see something, they will speak up. But of all the fraud cases that come to light in our country, only 4% come to light because of the external audit. That's wow. one in 25 folks. And so wow. how do these other ones come to light? It's things like good internal controls, good processes, good trust, but verify kinds of systems. That's how you prevent fraud, right? Your auditor is not really preventing fraud, um, but you have these other systems in place um, that aren't rocket science, um, but you have those good systems in place. And that's how, well, gosh, somebody who might be tempted to do something they're not supposed to. If they know good systems are in place, they're a lot less tempted to go down that path. And so many fraud stories, they start with that with a person having the best of intentions, you know, and they have a you know a personal emergency and they make they have poor judgment. And they decide that, you know, well, I'll just, you know, I need this ten thousand dollars for my spouse's medical bills, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay it back to the organization before anybody notices it's gone. But before you know it, that one time $10,000 thing is a balloon into 50,000 or 100,000 or more. So many of them start that way with the best of intentions. And then that person, you know, they little by little, they get corrupted by the easy money and their narrative to themselves changes. Like, I deserve this because I'm put upon in work and people don't treat me well and the executive director is mean to me to or that whatever. Extra time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, so it pretty soon it snowballs to where then it becomes too much to pay back or overwhelming or how do you put $50,000 back when 
that's a chunk of change. So exactly. yeah, that's so true. Exactly. Would you say too that audits are more of an after the fact discovery as opposed to prevention? There's a little bit of prevention there, right? Because uh, some, you know, certainly there's somebody's going to be reviewing some of the numbers at a high level. Um, and so there's a certain level of it, but especially like once a, a staffer, if a staffer is intent on, if an account is intent on um, making poor choices with the trust that they've been given, um, they will know how to dodge the auditor also. And okay, well, this auditor only looks at transactions that are $5,000 and above. So if I write a check to myself for $4,000, they're not going to look at it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you they so they they can learn the tricks, but you you put these other things in place, like you know, the the person who has act the 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 person who signs checks shouldn't be able to print checks out and vice versa. And certain checks need two signatures and there are a bunch of other things that aren't rocket science. Um, but they help to prevent that stuff. If the person who prints the checks out knows that somebody else has to review them. And that they're getting those checks with thing with the actual documentation for it, and they see that that person actually like asks questions on a regular basis, like, "Tell me again about this three hundred dollar purchase," or you know, I was looking through the credit card here, and why do we have all these twenty five dollar purchases at the grocery store? Like, we don't usually use groceries at our nonprofit. If if questions like that get asked on a regular basis, that's massive deterrence, and that's what you want, mm -hmm. right? Because right. again, so in so many cases, this per they're a good person who makes a couple of bad choices that cascade on them. Um, mm -hmm. And you just don't want them to have that temptation. If they're going through personal hard financial times, you want them to make choices that aren't stealing from the organization. Yeah, just being smart about setting up accountability and checks and balances in the system. And again, back to your back office systems that you're talking about, setting those up up front, it's not personal. It's just good business practice. And then when people plug into the system, it's just how the system works. It's not like you're singling out or pinpointing or picking on anyone. It's just they need to follow the system. It's there for a reason. Thank you for mentioning that, Teresa, because that's such an important point. The whole, we're not picking on you, beloved bookkeeper who's been here for 20 years. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing this because that meanie, Sean Hale, on Teresa Huff's <laughs> podcast, said that we need to do this and we dug in and and we verified that yeah we really shouldn't so it's not about you we still love you we still trust you but we want to have these systems in place um because you know throw throw me under the bus folks please throw me right. under the bus um right. because it, yeah. it, 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 because it is it's a hard conversation especially with that beloved bookkeeper but you don't want them to get tempted to make bad choices and any of us we're all all of us are human we can all make bad choices and we just want to as much as we want to we want to protect the organization against that yeah and that's a great point because it could be somebody brand new it could be somebody that's been there 20 years and doesn't like to let up control or doesn't want anyone else in their perfect system that they run and yeah it's that's not ideal <laughs> it sounds mm -hmm. like what we've told our kids many times like if you ever need to blame us or use us as an excuse feel free because if you know you can blame us if you don't want to do something or you don't want to go to a party you can always use us as the backup excuse if you yeah. ever need to so i mean it sounds like you're doing the same thing like hey say your accountant cost it or he's requiring this thing and that's how it is keep the totally. peace amongst the team there totally totally um yeah Throw me under the bus, folks, or throw your talk to your talk to your auditor or talk to your uh, your outside CPA, and they uh, if yeah they they should let you throw them under the bus to do the right thing. That that's part yeah. of our job, right? Yeah, and it reminds me of what I often tell clients with say their grant writing or preparation for grants. I have to ask sometimes some pretty pointed or it seems to me like nosy or personal questions. But part of the reason for it is because I have to look for the holes or the red flags before the funder does. Because if I don't look for them, you can bet the grant funder is going to be saying, wait a minute, 
why is did this happen? Why is this piece of the program unstable? And that's a problem. We're not going to donate money to that. But if I look for it ahead of time and say, okay, what's our plan for this? How are we going to address this properly? And how can we explain that we have it under control? That changes the whole perspective and it sets them up for capacity and success as opposed to, yeah, we're just trying to kind of hope they don't notice this little problem over here. Yeah, yeah, that strategy rarely works out well. If they don't find out before they find it, they'll find out as you're executing on the grant. Um, yeah. If we have time, I'd like to hit rewind because you made another important point, which is the, the administrator, bookkeeper, what have you, who gets territorial, right? And the person who's like, you know, always at their desk and they never take a vacation. And that is a big, big red flag for two reasons. One of them is that if they're the only person that can like run payroll or do the books or things like that, um, they very well could be getting themselves set up for burnout, right? If the whole organization shuts down because they're they're the only ones that can do that, you need to have good documentation of critical processes like payroll so that that person can take a sick day, even if it's payroll day, so that they can, you know, what, go on that vacation that they've been putting off for years and not just time their vacations between payroll. They should be able to take a vacation or have a sick day any day of the year. And uh, because really, uh, and I've gotten to see this over and over again, especially with administrators, because we're usually the last ones to speak up. And then we do speak up that we're like getting burnt out. We usually speak up in a way that most people define to be so soft. We think we've said it at the top of, top of our lungs, but for most people it's like, okay, well, you know, Terry's having a rough day, you know, we'll get around to that. Um, mm -hmm. When really to them, it feels like I'm screaming at the top of my lungs and I'm being such a drama queen. Oh my gosh. The other thing to I be aware of. I love that you of, point that out. Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing to be aware of, if you have an administrator who's not taking vacations, um, uh, that that is a, a red flag for possible fraud. And I'm not telling you that everybody who does it is committing fraud. In fact, most are probably not committing fraud. But when you look at the um, like the, the the wealth of fraud cases that happen in the kind of accounting position or people who are being trusted with money over and over and over again, you see, uh, yeah, this person didn't take vacation. And it's and they, you know, they always were the one doing the payroll. They're always the one in charge of all those, all those processes. Nobody else knew how to do it. Um, and they they know they can't let go and have other people do it because if somebody else looks at it for more than if they lift up the hood, they're going to see that there's something fishy, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of your protection for the organization is saying, yeah, you know, hey, Pat, you know, we love you. You do great work. We we need to insist that you take vacation. Um, even if all you do go is, you know, go home and watch paint dry or whatever, that's none of our business, but you need to go home. You need to go on vacation, whatever it is. And we need to be set up so that somebody else here knows how to run payroll and can run checks and these other things. This is one of the things that you do to protect your organization because, you know, even though that person is, you know, determined to be in that job, as long as they can draw breath, someday they're not going to be able to. And when that happens, when you lose a key accounting person on short notice and you don't have good documentation, it is so disruptive to the organization. It's so distracting. Um, it's hard to find people who can jump in on short notice. When you do find somebody who can jump in on short notice, like my organizations, we've had to jump in. It's incredibly expensive for you because we are recreating processes from scratch. That takes a whole lot more hours and we have to make a whole lot. Yeah, it just takes so many more hours versus us coming in and saying, okay, yeah, here's here's the documentation on payroll. Great, we got it. And we can make mm -hmm. sure people are still gonna get paid that day. If we get a call, you know, you know, at yeah, today we might be able to do payroll for somebody tomorrow if we had to. Um, but if we if we're recreating that from scratch, goodness gracious, <laughs> we there's a good chance that people are gonna go unpaid and then you have cascading problems, right? If you're because yeah. a lot of your staff are living most most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And so if they don't get the paycheck on the day that they're expecting it, then that can have really serious problems for them in their personal lives.
We don't want that. Mm. We want your yeah. staff to have stability. We want to have good, reliable back offices so that the staff can focus on the mission and not be worried about, am I going to get paid on time? Or is the light, are the lights going to come on? Is my the computer that I'm supposed to work with going to boot up today? What have you? Yeah. You don't want your yeah. staff worried about that. You want that part of their job to be easy peasy so they can do the life-giving work that they're doing. Right. Yeah. To take off that. And like I talked about in a previous episode, the more we can offload to a system, the more we can focus on that higher level strategic work and let the system work. But I mean, I have seen this where someone is so controlling of their role, they won't let anyone else touch it. And to me, you bring up a good point. It seems like they think they're being protective of the organization. They think they are protecting their territory and not letting people touch it because no one else can do it as good as me. No one else can do it right. I have to be the only one to do this. When really, you said it, it's actually exposing the organization to potential dangers, whether it's fraud, whether it's, I mean, heaven forbid, they were in a car accident and out of commission and no one else knew how to step in. Whatever the situation, it's actually more protective of the organization to say, okay, if I'm gone, here's my step-by-step binder of how to do payroll. Here's how you do the report. Here's how you run this. Like whatever it is, making sure either someone else is trained or there's a go-to place or someone else has the passwords and access. I mean, I just, I so agree because I've seen it and I've seen how that can hinder the organization to not have that access that they need. And sometimes totally. it does need to happen quickly. Totally. And even when when there, there are good intentions and desire to do the documentation, the old way that we did it, like building binders, is heavily time consuming and then it gets out of date really quickly. And so there's a really yes. cool tool that I've fallen in love with. I've even written a blog about it. I'll have to send it to you so you can add it to the show notes. The yeah. tool is called Loom, L O O M. And you can get a awesome. free trial. Yeah, it's awesome. And so, like, instead of taking 20 screenshots and writing, you know, 15 pages about how to do payroll and all the different exceptions, no, just the next time your payroll person sits down, they can use Loom to record to, to record their voice while it's capturing what's happening on the screen. And they just walk through, all right, you know, here's a standard payroll. And I click here and I click here and this, that, and the other. Bang, I'm done. All right. Now, here's how I do vacation and how we, ha we handle people's vacation time. And the click here, the click here, this, that, and the other. Bang. And it adds maybe an extra minute to them, to their process that they were going to do anyway, right? Just wait till the next time you do payroll or on Loom. And then that'll Loom creates a link up in the cloud for you. And you put that in your process manual, right? So your process manual might be like two pages long and it's all, it's just standard payroll, click here. Uh, <laughs> you know, maternity yeah. leave exceptions on payroll, click here. And, and you're done. Yeah, I love that. And it's searchable. And the thing about that too, that I have found from like, say years ago before Loom existed, when I did have to document certain steps on something, I would use the screenshots and step by step and spend that time, like you said, creating the document, then the software would update things would look completely different. The process would be completely different with the new software. <laughs> so it was like my training thing I had worked so hard to put together was obsolete. And then once we shifted and learned about Loom and tools like that, it was like, oh, that's old. I can just delete that one and replace it with a new one and just do a quick one step by step and have them all stored in one place. So you've created a whole library very quickly within the natural workflow that you're already doing. Exactly. And so the yeah, the extra lift to, to do that documentation is just very small. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, um, any other last minute myths you want to hit before we wrap up? I know you said you had several um, and so I, we could talk all day, but <laughs> is there any high level points that you want to make sure we hit certain ones? Let me see. Um, we talked a little bit about financial reports don't have to be hard. And we talked somewhat about that um, it's dangerous for your organization if you have an accountant who is always in their chair and never taking a vacation. You have the risk of burnout and of them potentially committing fraud. Um, 
some other day we'll talk about cheap versus frugal, which is a critical thing. So many of us, we, mm -hmm. we make choices as an organizations where um, we choose cheapness over frugality and frugality is being strategic about saving money, whereas cheapness is just, well, I'm going to buy the least expensive thing no matter what. And so like you wouldn't do that in your personal life, right? You wouldn't, if you needed new pants, you would not buy the cheapest pants off the rack because they're going to break in two, they're going to be no good in two weeks, right? And similarly, you want to make fruit you want to make frugal decisions with your nonprofit, right? And an investment that is going to pay for itself. But the overhead myth drives us to do things like not invest in equipment for our staff. And then we don't even notice that. And we think it's normal that, it, you know, we spend 20 minutes a day waiting for our computer to reboot and it's moving slowly and things like that. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's cheap versus uh, frugal at quickly. Um, and yeah. the other ones that. That's an important distinction. And I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. Um, nonprofits can make a profit. So many people think that we can't and the organization totally can. Um, nonprofits can have a deficit budget. And there are some times when it's a very smart thing to do. And there, you know, there's unpacking there, but it's absolutely something you should have on the table. Um, and then uh, a lot of people think that your treasurer needs to be a CPA. They totally don't. Um, it's, you know, sometimes them being a CPA can even be a part of the problem if they're a CPA who only knows how to speak CPA language um, and and or if they're coming from a different kind of C, if their accounting experience is not nonprofits of the size of, of your organization, then they can be trying to put a square peg into a round hole because not all accountants are the same. And so nonprofits, we really do need in that seat. We need somebody who's curious, somebody who's comfortable with numbers, but they don't need to be a numbers genius. That does not have to be part of their day job. Um, and they need to be willing to roll up their sleeves a bit. And if somebody has those characteristics, I might take that over a random CPA. Because um, yeah. it just that those characteristics, in my mind, um, it can be much more valuable and protect the organization much more than than some of the CPAs. Us, you know, they're not to disparage all my colleagues. They're awesome CPAs out there. Sure. But just like any any profession, some of us are duds. And so just those letters CPA don't tell you necessarily that that person's going to be a good treasurer. And to what you were saying earlier, can they translate to everyday language so that others can understand it? And sometimes someone is such an expert that it's like a foreign language to the rest of the world and they still need a translator. So if you have someone that can actually interpret into everyday language, tell me like I'm five, <laughs> show me step by step and hold my hand, then that can make all the difference in getting your team on board with this and understanding how they can be effective and use the numbers too. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. I feel like we could do more episodes on any one of those, <laughs> but, and, you know, maybe we'll hit on some of those in our Mythbusters series and we'll just keep that going, keep to. those in the lineup for future round tables of those. Yeah. So many myths we need to bust. So little yes, time. Yes. We will keep <laughs> at it. <laughs> yep. Start a movement. Well, as we wrap up, I would love to hear if there has been a particular resource that has been meaningful to you along the way. Yeah. There are a couple of things that I've, I've read recently that I'd recommend to folks. Uh, one of them is The Thief in Your Company by Tiffany mm -hmm. Couch. Um, this is a really good book written by a forensic CPA, but she writes in regular English for regular people. And folks, it does say thief in your company, but really this applies to nonprofits as well. And, you know, you heard, we, we spoke earlier about internal controls and this is what this is what this is about. It's written in regular everyday English, easy to read, helps you understand what kind of vulnerabilities your nonprofit might have and how you can shut the barn door before all the cows get out, right? So it's really a good book that way with really good practical tips in plain English. And the other one is The E-Myth Revisited um, by Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. And as I read that, I thought, oh, my gosh, I wish I had read this earlier in my nonprofit career. And I wish more of my colleagues were reading this. And this is another book that is technically or pointed at businesses. And if you get triggered by, you know, business speak, then stay away. But other way, you know, if you're able to translate out of, you know, a little bit of business language into other stuff, what this book does, and I think especially for, for small, small businesses or small nonprofits, is it helps you understand the different stages of growth. It helps under, you understand what kind of leader you are, especially if you're an executive director, what, what 
sparks joy for you, what might not. And it, it can help you get unstuck. Many of our nonprofits are stuck and we just think that's the way things are supposed to be. And that's, well, no, it's, it's not. And this book does a really good job of helping you understand those things. And again, in regular English, a good mix of stories, not a whole lot of technical stuff, um, but it, it's a good spot to go um, either if you want to prevent getting stuck with your organization or if you want to get it unstuck to really figure out, yeah, how do I do things differently? I want my organization to thrive. I want it to thrive at a different level. Or I'm personally feeling burnt out um, by the work that, you know, I've been here with nose to the grindstone for five years. And, you know, I thought I was going to love this. And now I dread coming into work. Well, th this is this is a good book to help you maybe figure out, okay, what's going on here? What can I do differently tomorrow so that I can rediscover the joy? I can put the, and a lot of it has to do with, as you mentioned, systems, putting systems in place so that my time as a leader can be, I can put it in those things that only I can do and get systems and or other people to pick up the other parts of this that need to happen so that we can have an organization that can increase its impact. To most of our nonprofits, we do want to increase our impact, whether that means um, you know, more children fed or more cats adopted or more people visiting our museum, whatever it is, we want, most of us want to grow that impact. And this is a good way to get good ideas about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it's good to break out of our own sector or niche and get creative ideas from something completely unrelated. You know, maybe you're in a food pantry type of nonprofit, go look at, I don't know, an art museum or go to an art show or just a car show, something else completely different, completely unrelated. And maybe you'll get some fun, creative ideas. And sometimes it's the same way with books. We might get ideas that we can pick and choose. It doesn't mean we have to try and follow step-by-step step everything there, but if we can pull those concepts and figure out what are we missing and what could we plug in to really move it forward. I think that's totally. fantastic resources. So thank you. And um, tell us how can we connect to learn more about you, your services? How can people connect with you? I know you post a lot of good stuff on LinkedIn, which I enjoy following and seeing the conversations that you start. So tell us oh. where we can find you. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, certainly, um, you know, I, I do try to post daily on LinkedIn, uh, something that's going to be a, a lot of it's reposting, just something that I think is going to be a value of interest um, to to colleagues um, and to nonprofits. Um, my website is www.seanhale.org, S-E-A-N-H-A-L-E. And uh, my team and I, we do provide services like interim finance and accounting, fractional CFO services. We do special projects, of course, and um, also help nonprofits out cal calculating their indirect cost rate, which we mm -hmm. think is going to be really important for nonprofits that are trying to avoid burning their accountants out, right? Most accounting teams have gotten stretched during the great resignation, and that could be the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of organizations. And so, you know, you might not be in a position where you need another staffer, but getting rid of some discrete tasks can help. Um, and then I do have um, also a side gig that a friend and I started. We're coming up on the second anniversary um, called Philanthro Force. So kind of like philanthropy, philanthropy plus force dot org, Philanthro Force. And basically, we help nonprofits to find the right consultants. And so it's a free service to nonprofits. Uh, we have more than 400 consultants listed there now across more than 70 specialties and uh with a bunch of other neat stuff, a bunch of different issue areas, um, people who speak more than 14 different languages, and we have a really good search feature so that you can not just get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, here are 100 people who do strategic planning, but instead, wow, here's somebody who does strategic planning and is also bilingual in Spanish. That's important to us because we want to engage our Spanish, our monolingual Spanish stakeholders. And uh, they are also passionate about K-12 education, and we do K-12 education like those are the those are the people you want to talk to, right? Not just the person that was did a great job for my friend who runs the dog society. Like, great, you know, absolutely have them in the pool. But if you can also add people to the your pool that you're considering for your strategic planning or whatever the opportunity is, who have a really a strong match with what you're doing, then all the better. 
Sure. And I love that because even like I was talking to a nonprofit the other day that they are in the US, but they have operations in another country and their director of the entire program only speaks Spanish. So that could be a challenge for someone trying to collect financial data, collect program information, if they don't speak the same language and trying to translate in between. So being able to communicate directly could be a huge benefit. And so I think that's a fantastic platform that you built. I love the searchability and the functions that you've really taken into account that make it super practical. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. This is such good information. And I feel like we could take, <laughs> again, the indirect cost rate. That could be another episode in itself to explain that sometimes. So I appreciate all your time and wisdom and sharing these practical tips and experiences with us. And I hope it gives people really some food for thought of how can they really look at their systems, their operations, and uncover those blind spots to make things run better and ultimately serve their mission in a much more fulfilling and healthy capacity. Right on, right on. Um, yeah, just remembering that a key to having a thriving nonprofit is having a strong back office, just like, you know, we, we take care of our back, we take care of our stomach, even though we don't see them, if we want to be healthy individuals. We need to take care of those things that um, might not be visible, but are, are critical to our health. Yep. Yep, exactly. All right. Well, thank you. And we will talk soon. Thanks, Teresa. I would love to hear from you. Was there anything that surprised you or was unexpected in this conversation with Sean? Anything that you might rethink differently of how you're running your processes or your systems or tracking your finances. I think we need to dig deeper into some of these things like the 990 and make sure our board is educated, make sure we understand what the different parts are and what they mean, and how to effectively use the information. So he makes a lot of great points. I encourage you to go back and listen to those myths or take notes on those and share them with your board. And help them understand as well that we need to have these good processes based in what actually works and based in credible facts, as opposed to just perpetuating myths that we've believed because that's how we've always done it. So let's rethink that. Let's challenge that. And how can we do things better? How can we do them with excellence? I would love to hear from you. What is an action step that you are going to do today, this week that you're committing to as a result of this podcast episode? Let me know on LinkedIn or my website contact form. Send me a message and I want to hear what action you are going to take. If you are interested in grant writing and thinking about it, not sure where to start, go take my quiz. Do you have what it takes to be a grant writer? at teresahuff.com slash quiz, and we'll keep the conversation going. All right, friends, have a great week and go change your world.